Okay, so to start with, I want to talk about this idea of fretting the little things. And one of the best examples of this was this guy here, Steve Jobs, the creator and founder of Apple. Um, he died a few years ago, and then there were a whole bunch of biographies that came out about him and all of his business decisions and his design decisions. And one of the most interesting stories that came out of these biographies was um, a kind of the story of his very, very acute atten attention to detail, where he cared about every tiny minor thing. He cared about the exact shape of the iPhone. Um, there's a story um, from a few years ago when the iPhone first came out, um, they were trying to figure out different types of glass that they would put on the iPhone. Um, and he ended up putting the, a prototype iPhone in his pocket and it got scratched up a little bit because of his keys. And so he rejected that type of glass immediately because he wanted something that was more sturdy and not scratchable. And so they decided to use Gorilla Glass, for instance. And so throughout his career, he was very, very hyper-focused on tiny, tiny details. Um, one of the best examples of this is actually the story of this computer here. This is the Apple IIe. It was released in the early 1980s and it lasted for like 11 years. It was on the market for a really long time because it was a very reliable, powerful computer for back in the day. Um, and Steve Jobs and the, the team that helped design this thing, he cared a ton about the design. He wanted to make this thing look really good. He consulted with um, industrial designers in Germany um, to make it look like super modern and fancy and follow like fashion principles and design principles. Um, so externally, it looks cool. Um, other computers back in the 80s were a lot boxier. Um, they didn't kind of have the, this, this nice design aesthetic from the early 80s here. But he was so obsessed, Steve Jobs was, with the design of this thing at every single level um, that there were potentially significant delays in creating this thing. And if you read any biography, like the year leading up to the release of the Apple IIe was like hell for his um, employees because he was pushing them to make like tiny, tiny fixes. Um, the best example of this is actually on the inside of the Apple IIe. Um, this is what a standard circuit board looked like back in the day. This is from the IBM PC Junior. And so this is the, the motherboard for it. So you can see all of these different circuits and the and the capacitors and all these different chips that are kind of plugged into the board. And if we talk about crap and contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity, um, some of these things are aligned, but not all of them. Like you can draw an invisible line here and that kind of lines up, but then there's another alignment and there's another alignment. And so not everything like fits graphic design wise. Um, but if you look at the circuit board for the Apple IIe, it looks like this. Everything is like perfectly aligned and it follows all sorts of graphic design principles. Nobody sees this thing. This is the inside guts of the computer. Um, but they were so focused on making sure everything was perfect. Um, they spent significant time making sure that this worked well. Um, the reverse side of this has the names of the, the designers of the inside of the computer. It's like etched onto the circuit board. So they stuck their signature on there. Um, but it, this is like a very well-designed circuit board. All of these little circuits that are um, embedded in the board follow kind of straight lines. They're not kind of all over the place here. And so even at like a very internal level, um, Apple has originally, like from the beginning, they cared a lot about the design of their things um, at, an, at an overly obsessive level, but in a way that was like um, they cared about the end users. And this is kind of filtered into um, their whole ethos as a company. Um, one thing that they've helped to develop is this idea of human focused design, where they want, or Apple's whole goal is to sweat the tiny details so that it's easy and pleasant for their users to use the computer or to use the phone or to use the iPad. Um, and so if you've ever set up a new iPhone, it's fairly easy, the onboarding process. Like it tells you where to click, it tells you how to swipe, it teaches you how to use the thing. It's, it's very human centered um, and it, it works pretty well. Um, the reason this works is Apple actually has a whole um, set of something they call human interface guidelines. Um, that this is kind of their style guide for how to make computers and how to make programs on computers and how to design documents with the end user in mind. Um, you can go, if you search for human interface guidelines, you can find this. Um, they publish it. Other companies have since um, made their own. Google and Microsoft both have their own human interface guidelines that help define what makes a Google app look like, look like a Google app or a Microsoft app look like a Microsoft app with the 
with the consideration for human needs and user interaction built into it. And so they make specific design decisions to make it easy for people to use. Um, and the attention to detail is very, very minute. If you look at these guidelines here, they'll tell you like the exact pixel sizing for specific elements. They'll take you, tell you the exact location for specific elements and often a justification for why it's that way. And it's all done with the intent of helping the end user have a better experience and do better. Um, and so there's a, a huge focus on fretting over the little things. And this, this is important because it applies to data visualization. Um, you can do tiny little changes to your graph to make it work better. Um, some of you um, in your problem in your exercises that you've turned in, I've made some comments like um, a couple of you took off the plot lines um, to make um, a cleaner grid, which is great, but you didn't take off the axis ticks down at the bottom, which are those tiny ticks that show kind of they line up with the numbers at the bottom. If you take off the plot lines, you don't need the axis ticks either. Um, and so that's a very tiny thing. It's easy to overlook, but if you remove it, it actually improves the readability of the graph because it gets rid of kind of those black dots or those black ticks at the bottom. It's a very minor thing, but it's important to kind of pay attention to the tiny details because it makes life easier. Um, a good example of this, um, Klaus Wilkie in the reading you had for today um, goes over this a lot. He has lots of um, bad examples of graphs and good examples of graphs. And often the difference is just very, very, very small. Um, so if you look at this first graph, this is using the iris data set um, that was invented for eugenics. So yay, iris. Um, this is a good scatter plot. It's showing um, the relationship between the sepal length and the sepal width of these iris flowers. Um, and it's coloring by um, the three different um, species of iris flowers here. So that's cool. This is great. You could publish this. This is awesome. But Klaus Wilkie calls this a bad chart. And the reason why is because if you are colorblind or if you have to print this in grayscale, this, this color encoding dies. Um, you can't really easily tell the difference between the yellow and the green or the green and the blue, and these will all look like the same color, which means your cool distinction between these different species goes away. And you'll have no idea that these um, shorter sepaled irises are the iris setosa versus the other ones and you lose that ability to, to see what's going on. So his recommendation is to change the graph to this. And if you notice, it is basically identical. The only different thing is um, the, the dots are still colored, but they're also shaped. Um, he mapped um, the species to the shape aesthetic as well as the color aesthetic. And by doing that, um, now you can actually match up the diamond with the square and the circle. So if this is printed in black and white and you lose the ability to distinguish colors, or if you're colorblind and you can't distinguish between these colors, you can still figure out what's going on in the plot. Um, it's a tiny, tiny design decision. It's a tiny minor detail, but implementing that makes it easier for the end user to actually interpret your graph. And so it's important to fret about those tiny details. This is another example, and this is a common example. And it's really kind of annoying when you run into it, um, but it's a good thing to fix. So in this example, this is great. It's a line plot showing stock prices of the four big uh, technology companies. Um, Alphabet, that's technically Google's name on the stock market and their umbrella company for all their sub companies. So that's Google, Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft. And that looks great. Um, I would often just kind of stop at that point and put that in a paper and call it good. But the issue here is that the order of the lines doesn't match up with the order of the legend. This top line is Facebook. And so Facebook, in theory, should be the first thing in the legend here, and then Google slash Alphabet, and then Microsoft, and then Apple. So it would be really cool if we could get this legend to be in the same order as what's appearing in the data um, here at the end of the data. And so this is the better version of it. All we did is we reordered the category, we reordered the factor by the stock price at the end of the time period here so that these things line up. And that's a tiny minor detail. It takes a while um, to Google it and figure out how, and then once you do it and you remember and you can keep it in a document somewhere and if, if you have to do it again, you go reference it. Um, but it makes the plot a lot more accessible. Um, again, if, you're, uh, if your audience is colorblind or if this is printed in black and white, um, 
even if you can't distinguish these colors, this is Facebook, and then that is Alphabet, and that is Microsoft, and that is Apple. And if you lose the ability to see the colors here, you can still figure out what's going on in the plot. If you're in this land here, you're going to think that that top line is going to be Google slash Alphabet, but it's not. Um, his final suggestion to make this even better is to get rid of the legend completely and just put Facebook right here and Alphabet there and Microsoft there and Apple there and have it be directly labeled, which is an all, that's also a good thing to do. And using the tools that we're going to cover in the next section, you can do that. You just add geom text and it'll stick the, the text labels on there. So moral of the story here is worrying about the tiny details in graphs, like getting rid of the, the axis ticks that are stuck there, or rearranging the, the legend, or moving the legend in a little bit, or doing something that's just a minor graphic design um, issue. Um, doing that is actually good because it makes it easier for your audience to understand what you're communicating. It improves the beauty of the graphics that you're making. And as we talked about in the very first session, um, if we want to communicate truth more effectively, beauty is a very important component of that. And so it actually enhances the truth value of these graphics, if we can get things, the, the tiny niggling issues, if we can get those fixed, it's going to be a better graphic and be better at communication. So pay attention to the little details. As you do your um, mini projects, the first of which is due um, this weekend, um, the comments that I'm going to give you, lots of them will be about contrast repetition and alignment proximity, and lots of them might be little tiny minor things like, um, you could italicize something or make this one element line up with the other element or rearrange the legend or something. It's going to be a minor thing. Um, and it's with good reason again. I'm not trying to be Steve Jobs and like totally obsess about every tiny glyph inside your graph or something like that. But in general, you want to make sure you take care of these, these minor things to make a better experience for people. So pay attention to that when you're making your graphs and look for that when I um, give you comments on your mini projects.